please welcome Howard Taylor, the creator of Schlock Mercenary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. That was very kind. Uh, when he says uh, interesting, was it interesting illustration style? That's uh, the word I'm looking for. Um, euphemism. It's a euphemism for the art sucked. Uh, <laughs> taught myself to draw starting in 2000 with the first strip and started publishing them on the web because, hey, what's the worst thing that could happen? Um, Let's go ahead and, are you advancing slides from, oh, sorry, I just, I, I didn't know if you could do it from sitting down. I am a full-time cartoonist. I've been doing it daily since 2000. When I say I've been doing it daily, that does not mean I draw something every day. That means you get to read something every day. I cue my work up in advance because I'm not a total masochist. I worked for Novell from July of 1993 until September of 2004. You can read Schlock Mercenary for free every day at schlockmercenary.com. This slideshow is available in the soft copy of whatever you guys have access to. So if you can't remember how to spell schlock or mercenary, you're covered. You can look up that page for reference. All 3,001 days of schlock mercenary are available online for you to read. And when I say 3,001, that's as of today. Yesterday was my 3,000th strip in 3,000 days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It took eight years and change, and it occupies uh, four or five uh, little uh, file little file boxes, legal size file boxes in my office. Um, go ahead and advance the slide again. Let me tell you a little bit about the newspaper cartooning business. I I'm not here to plug my own work much further than I've already plugged it because I've been uh, pretty vociferous on that already. I'm here to tell you about the free content business model and how it works. And I'm going to use cartooning as an example of the disruption that is happening as a result of the web, as a result of what we sometimes refer to as the democratization of content. Newspaper cartoon syndicates field roughly 10,000 applications per year. That's a lot of people who want to be cartoonists. The syndic they syndicate somewhere between five and 10 new strips per year. And when I say they syndicate them, they pick them up and then they try to start selling them to newspapers and newspaper editors are ornery, stubborn, changeless dinosaurs who are very reluctant to change the comics page unless they can find a way to save money. Picking up a new comic and making the page bigger is never going to happen and in fact, uh, as of late 2006, no newspaper cartoonist syndicated since 2000 uh, has yet been able to get by on cartooning income alone. Okay, it's a, well, back up just a little bit. I want to qualify that. I had a footnote there, and apparently the footnote's gone. Oh, well. Um, it's now 2008. I haven't checked the data, but I'm pretty sure that a couple of guys, uh, the, um, oh, what's his name with all the, the cute little black children, the, and they did a cartoon. Boondocks. Boondocks. Yeah, signing a TV deal, um, he's, he's doing okay. And there are a couple of other guys, I think, who are doing okay. But it is a very, it's a vanishing, vanishingly small number when you compare it to 10,000 applications per year. Now, next slide. The web cartooning business. Somewhere between 5,000 and 20,000 comic strips have sprung up on the web in the last 10 years. And 99% of them are crap because Sturgeon was an optimist. You, you know Sturgeon's law. 90% of everything is crap. Yeah, 99% of them are just... There, and when I say crap, I'm saying this in the, in the kindest possible way. When your high school kid decides he wants to try his hand at writing a comic strip that's about him and his friends in the locker room, the odds are really good that it's going to be crap. But you and the family are going to love it because this is the output of your child. And it's nice to see it on the web instead of on the refrigerator for you. But the rest of us are going to continue to mock it. There are others of us who are very, very professional and who are trying to, you know, strike into this medium and really do something cool on the web. And we are that 1%, which is about 2,000. No, that's 10%. 10% of us would be about 2,000. 200 of us are really, really good at what we're doing and, and have managed to rise above the noise and present some signal that's very, very interesting. At least two dozen of us have quit our day jobs and gone full-time since 2000. The most successful pair among them 
have several employees and own a cartooning business that grosses over a million dollars a year. How many of you have ever been to E3, the big video game show? Anybody ever been to E3? One hand. Also been to the World Science Fiction Convention. The man gets around. Work for him. He sounds like a neat guy. Um, the uh, E3 was the big video game convention, and it used to be that if you had a press pass or knew somebody who knew somebody, you could go. And E3 got big, and the video game companies started complaining. A couple of guys who were at this convention all the time, uh, Jerry Holkins and Mike Krahulik of Penny Arcade, uh, they would write about E3. These days, and in fact, right now, the Penny Arcade Expo, created by Jerry Holkins and Mike Krahulik, who are a writer and an illustrator of web comics, is bigger than E3 is. Now, part of this is because E3 got a lot smaller, but these guys are running a convention that has 40,000 people at it right now up in Seattle. That is the web cartooning business at its apex. Next slide. So, we're talking about newspaper cartooning. Don't miss the boat. I'll let you read this comic by my friend Chris. I think it's funny. <laughs> Do we, um, are we ready for the rim shot? Okay, rim shot. I think it's hilarious. The, the, Oh, sorry, Newspaper Syndicate Submissions Office. This is the humorous principle of juxtaposition. We have the time traveler going back in time to catch the Titanic, and then the juxtaposition with the newspaper. I thought it was a lot funnier than that. Okay, next slide. <laughs> so what's the difference? Why are new web cartoonists currently more successful than new newspaper cartoonists? People don't read the newspapers anymore. Actually, I've got a whole slide on that. Next slide. I, look, I told you not to put them in upside down. <laughs> I told you not to put the... Next slide. There we go. See how easy that was to fix? The difference is, one, they can keep more of the revenue themselves. That's a nice thought. We're going to cover that in a minute. They can target niche audiences. This is huge. There's demand for comics that are too smart, too sexy, too filthy, too politically incorrect, and too over the top for newspaper syndicates. This is a large part of it, and I'll touch on that in a moment. It's easier to monetize web content than newspaper content. Okay, show of hands, how many of you have picked up a newspaper in the last six months? Okay, in reading that newspaper, have you ever looked at an article and in your head tried to double click on something? <laughs> have you done that? Have you do we are all starting to do that. Matter of fact, I drive I, I'm, I'm on the road, and I'm trying to double-click on car, drag, select, move unit, move unit, okay, follow unit. I, the, internet, the internet is informing everything that we do, and it is so much easier to monetize web content than newspaper content. But finally, web cartoonists know how to hustle. We know we know how to hustle. We don't have a syndicate backing us up. We are artist entrepreneurs, and in fact, one of the distinctions between web cartoonists and newspaper cartoonists is when the two of us get together and argue about stuff, because that's all we ever do, the newspaper cartoonist says, I don't want to be a t-shirt salesman. And the web cartoonist says, I don't want to be poor. <laughs> and we never, we don't meet in the middle. We, we have yet to meet in the middle. Now I want to talk about each of these points very, very briefly. Keeping more of the revenue themselves. Uh, I played a little Price is Right game. If you want a book, would you hold the book up so people can see it? Um, you've already stuffed them in your backpacks. Okay, a couple of books. All right, these books, uh, retail price on those is 15 bucks at my web store, and I'm paying, I'm going to spout out an average now, I'm paying a buck 50 for them. I'm paying 10% of full retail, and I'm charging full retail. Why? Because I'm only selling about 2,000 books. But 2,000 times 80% of $15 pays the bills for six months. We can target niche audiences. Anybody here ever heard of XKCD? You've all heard of XKCD. I met Randall Monroe at Comic Con. He is a, a brilliant, humorous, kind, soft-spoken uh, young man. You'd, you'd love to introduce him to your daughters, I'm sure. Great guy. Pardon? It's complicated. Um, XKCD targets a group of people who are very, very highly educated and have a quirky sense of humor and 
a lot of people who are into Garfield or Kathy or whatever look at XKCD and say, the artwork is crappy and it's not funny. All right, XKCD makes me laugh about two times out of three. I will look at it and I will actually laugh. Garf Garfield makes me laugh like negative one times <laughs> for every reading. At this point, it just it stopped being funny when I stopped being 10. <laughs> so niche audiences, if you present content to a niche audience, or if you present content on the internet, don't expect the whole internet to read it. But know that if you are targeting a niche audience, that audience may gobble it up and pass it along among themselves, and you can have a huge following in a very short period of time. Uh, monetizing web content, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, you, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Monetizing web content. This is business 101. A lot of you are probably looking at this slide and saying this needs to be much more complicated. There's an entire MBA degree summed up in these bullet points, and you're right. One, identify revenue streams. Two, pick the highest margin, lowest investment streams first. These are your low-hanging fruit. Okay, now, do any of you see marketing speak on this slide? Is there marketing speak on this slide a little bit? Yeah, sorry, used to be a marketing guy. It's actually been very, very useful. Advertise your chosen stream, whether it's books, t-shirts, whatever, to your captive audience. Uh-oh. Getting this is a real challenge. I'm going to cover that in a few minutes. And finally, collect the money, deliver the goods, and keep your customers happy. How many of you have ever done business with a, a large company, something's gone wrong, and you've emailed them, and they've emailed you back, and it's resulted in you saying, I'm not shopping there again? Anybody? Okay, now, next show of hands, how many have ever shopped at a business, large or small, where you've exchanged email with them and they have literally bent over backwards to send you stuff and you've realized that you're worried about them because it would be so easy to rip them off, but they made you happy? Anybody ever had that happen? Yes. Okay, who are you still spending money with? The people you could rip off. Well, why aren't you ripping them off? Because, because you, you, yeah, you're good people. People are inherently good, and that's one of the things that I love about this model, is that when we talk about keeping customers happy, when we talk about giving the customer what they want and, and, and helping them, we expose ourselves to being ripped off, and our customers don't do that. Human beings are naturally good people. I'm very optimistic, and, and this business plan is one that is built on a very faithful sort of optimism. Let's hit the next slide. Free content revenue, revenue streams. First and foremost, donation drives. How many of you have ever given money to somebody using a PayPal button? Just given money away. Anybody ever done that? Cool. Have any of you ever been on the receiving end? Any of you have a donation button up and gotten money? Yeah. It's a, it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling to give. It's a good feeling to get. I would like to say and because it's funny that it is a better feeling to get than to give, but it's not. It always feels better to give than to get. Okay, I love receiving. I did a coloring book uh, last year, uh, a PDF coloring book, and it was 21 pages, black and white, PDF, digital download, and I said, for any size donation, you can, I'll give you the download link. I made $4,000 in two weeks. It feels really good to be able to pay those bills, but on the other hand, I feel very humbled and I feel very indebted to the people who are giving such that I have to crank out better and better content in order to keep these people happy. The people who gave, the average, the, the median donation was like seven bucks. Show of hands, how many of you have ever paid seven dollars for a coloring book? This doesn't happen. These are very, very nice people who are doing this for me, and I recognize that. It's humbling. I cannot, uh, it's the word I'm looking for. I cannot get up here and blow my own horn and talk about how great I am because I'm not. I'm dependent on wonderful, wonderful people who I have managed to connect with. Um, advertising products and services for other people. Google AdSense is a great example of a turnkey solution for that. Uh, AdsDAC from Context Web is a good solution for that. 
uh, Project Wonderful founded by a couple of cartoonists is a great solution for that. The challenge with this is that you are being paid a very small slice of money for the opportunity to let people look at an advertisement on your page. Selling products and services based on your unique content pays much, much better. You put up a little ad on your site that says, and hey, I've got books for sale. You sell one book, make $15. Um, that's worth about 20,000 page views or more uh, of Google AdSense. You know, you make a, money a lot faster actually selling goods and services based on your content. And finally, selling products and services almost completely unrelated to your unique content, like for instance, clever t-shirts. If you've ever been out to Diesel Sweeties, anybody here read Diesel Sweeties? Few hands. Uh, Diesel Sweeties is a very pixelated looking comic kind of funny, he, he uh, comes up with slogans, just, and I can't, now I can't think of any of them, but you know, pardon? Bacon is a vegetable, is one of his t-shirts. Bacon is a vegetable, that's, you know, I'd, how many would wear that? How many of you would wear that? I, okay, hilarious, and he's making good money on it because he's, it looks a little bit like this, but he's taking all of the money home. These are some of the revenue streams, and pro I'm going to call them the principal revenue streams for free content on the web. The key to success is the captive audience, those words that I underlined so carefully with my finger a moment ago. 40,000 people read Schlock Mercenary each day. That's a lot of people. According to Google Analytics, I have 134,000 absolutely unique people. I love the way Google tries to sell that to me. I know that this is 134,000 absolutely unique people stopping by my site each month. That number seems a little bit inflated to me because I know how they're collecting the information. As if, I, I mean, I don't really know how they're collecting the information, but they've got to cookie me in order to know that this is an absolutely unique IP address. And a lot of people have cookies turned off. But, still a big number. 80% of surveyed Schlock readers identified Schlock Mercenary as their number one or number two favorite comic strip. My mentor in uh, all things marketing, guy by the name of Richard Bliss, and I'm sure some of you in here know him, uh, when I showed him that number, he said, you can take that to the bank. I said, well, how? I write it down and present it to the bank and write a check and, and have them, you know, let me write checks against it? And he said, no, but almost, almost. If you are their number one or number two favorite, these people will these are the people who are spending money on the coloring book. These are the people who are spending $15 on a book collection that they, they know cost me less than $3 to print. These are your number one fans. There was an article on the web a, a while back, and I can't remember the author's name, but if you Google 1,000 true fans, you can find this article. Have any of you, have any of you read the 1,000 true fans article? A couple of hands. The principle behind this was you can have a million readers and not make any money for your blog or your music site or whatever, but if you have a thousand true fans who are willing to spend one day's pay with you once per year, you've got it made. Now he qualified that, he says one day's pay equals $100 and you get to keep 80% of it. Well that's an $80,000 a year salary off of 1,000 true fans. It's a neat principle, harder to make it work than maybe it looks on paper, but it's very, very mathematically sound. I did not decide to print books myself until I had this information. Once I knew that I had some people, a lot, it, it was like 4,000 survey respondents, 80% of whom uh, put me as their number one or number two favorite. Uh, once I knew that, I went ahead and dropped uh, $10,000 on my first print run, and it was, make no mistake, the last $10,000 liquid that I had. Had that failed, I would have had to go back to work with Jared because uh, I was out of money. So I'm waving at Jared. We worked together at Novell. Uh, how many of you have worked, worked with me at Novell before? I know, there's a, I know there's a few of you. Yep, there we go. All right. Um, not, not coming back. Not, I love the company, but not coming back. My life is fantastic. Next slide, please. Let me open the kimono a little bit. I want to tell you about these revenue streams some. The Taylor Corporation, yes, I'm incorporated. It's an S-corp. It makes taxes so much easier to file. 
uh, collects an average total of $1,500 a month in advertising revenue from Adstat, Google, Blank Label, Amazon, and others. And again, my footnotes have disappeared. That's, oh well. Uh, that's in roughly in decreasing order of importance. T-shirt and minor merchandise sales generate about $10,000 per year. When I say T-shirt and minor merchandise sales, would you throw a shirt or two out into the audience? Just, just throw it. Just chuck it. Oh, give it a, give it a good huck. Weren't there two shirts over there? Did somebody already? Uh, he's sitting on it. All right. This one, hand, hand that to me. Hand that to me. This one smells like his butt. Woo! All the way to the back. Sorry, that was good. You saw it coming. I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, yeah, those, those uh, go ahead and move down the sides and chuck some. These are uh, fridge magnets made out of acrylic cut with lasers. <laughs> lasers. I, you know what? It sounds like a silly little marketing thing. Local company called Castle Rock. Uh, Castle Rock LLC, I don't remember the exact name of the company. Their website is a train wreck. Uh, but a friend of mine worked for them and said, yeah, you can get these things printed up. They actually cost me a buck each, which is a lot to have to pay for merchandise, especially when I can get a book for you know, that and a little more. Um, but I put these up on my website. I actually have uh, a set of eight here, which I'm going to give to the man who is sitting on the smelly shirt. Um, <laughs> Uh, this set of eight, you know, cost me eight dollars. I sell it for twenty, and I think we sold five hundred units. If you do the math, that's I mean, that's where this number comes from. And finally, book sales generate about sixty thousand dollars a year, which is a uh, a total of around eighty-eight k. All right. I still don't have my Nobel salary back, but I was able to purchase back my soul. Because, you know, I used to work in marketing. So, oh, I got some applause for that. Thank you so much. It's a little joke. It needed a lot of love. Okay, let me open the kimono a little wider. Under new management, book pre orders generated $2,000 or $22,000 of pure profit in one month. This was the first book that I invested money in. This was the point at which Sandra and I looked at each other and said, I can stay quit. Like, it's working. This is actually sustainable. Well, it, we, it wasn't sustainable until six months later we did this and realized, okay, they bought it twice. They liked the first book enough to buy the next book. Uh, the third book grossed around $60,000 in 60 days, continues to sell well. I go to conventions and make between four and ten thousand dollars in a weekend selling books to science fiction fans it's a very it's a very sweaty sort of active living because you know boxing up books is no fun um, but it's a lot more fun than than I found working for somebody else I am a hundred percent passionate about the job that I currently have this business model would not be possible if it were not for open source, the, the whole concept of free content, and the work of people like you. Thank you so much for writing the code that makes this kind of thing possible. Thank you. <laughs> Grizzly bear soup. This living that I'm making is a lot like the recipe for grizzly bear soup. Step one, kill a grizzly bear. Step two, th the rest is just a soup recipe. If you have any business training at all, you can take the captive audience, you can take the thousand true fans, you can take the 80% of 4,000 who say I am their number one or two favorite, you can take the 40,000 daily readers and you can monetize that. The trick is killing that grizzly bear. Next slide. Um, Compelling daily content. The difference between me and a lot of other web cartoonists is that I'm doing it every day and I'm not missing updates. Why did I start doing it this way? Because I was reading a comic strip called Sluggy Freelance and I started reading it and then he, he, they had their first baby and he did this hiatus thing where he had a bunch of guest artists come in and I was bored. And I thought, well, this is miserable. If I do a comic strip, I'm not doing that. And so I haven't. 
and I've had two kids. My wife has had two kids. I helped a little. Um, uh, I was there when it happened, um, but I didn't miss any days because of family emergencies or vacations or separating my shoulder or any of that junk because I worked ahead because I planned on compelling daily content. You need thousands or even tens of thousands of returning visitors. Um, I know a lot of cartoonists who are trying this and it's just not working for them. One of my good friends, Steve Troop, uh, created a comic strip called Melon Pool, which has been running for 15 years. And he could not get more than a few thousand people to read his comic at any one time. I don't know what the problem was, but he went out into the woods, found a grizzly bear, shot at it, and missed. So he's launched a new comic strip. His content was not compelling enough. Um, and finally, between 1,000 and 3,000 true fans for whom your work is their number one favorite. That, that is the grizzly bear. Um, it, have any of you ever uh, hung around with people who have degrees in English? I'm not going to make cheap jokes at their expense. I know a lot of people who are writers who want to work full-time as writers, and they go and they get a degree in English. Getting a degree in English in order to become a writer is like studying grizzly bear anatomy in order to kill a grizzly bear. Okay? You know a lot about the shape of the bear, but you're going to set foot into the woods and have a tree fall on your head because what you should have been studying is geography and climatology and the care and feeding of baby bears and, and zillions of things that make your life more interesting than a degree in English. And that's just the beginning of this, this, I can't teach you how to kill a grizzly bear. I can teach you how to take a dead bear and make soup, but I can't teach you how to kill the bear. Any environmentalists in the room? Tired of the metaphor? Sorry. I, I've never met a grizzly bear I didn't like, so next slide. Q&A, any questions? How are we doing on time? Five minutes, all right. Yes, sir. Okay, the question is, have I had a brush with success? Have I been accused of selling out? Uh, has my head gotten too big for my shoulders? That would be really awful because as bald as it is, it already looks too large. Um, Selling out, gosh, I've got two words for you, schlock and mercenary. I, <laughs> would I sell it? Have I sell? I don't know if I, if I would or if I had. But I told myself from day one, there will always be new schlock mercenary at this site for free for as long as I live or forever, whichever comes first. Um, I had this commitment to my fans. And I've been approached a number of times about, you know, merchandising, taking it offline, whatever, and I'm just not interested in that. A large portion of not letting it go to your head is remembering that this model is powered by those thousand true fans who don't just like your work, they feel like they like you. And you have to work hard to be likable. There are a lot of guys out there who aren't likable and whose public personas get in their way. And I. I don't know if I have a brush with that or not. I, yes, sir? Uh, do you use free software to do your comics? Do I, use, free software? do I use free software to create my comics? No, I don't. And that's because when I left Novell, I realized that my computer no longer needed to be a political statement, and so I picked the tools that worked best. Yeah. Okay? I picked the tools that worked best. I've tried GIMP. GIMP and I did not get along. Um, so, and, and so right now I'm invested, heavily invested in Photoshop. So I use Photoshop for all of my coloring, all of my image processing. I use InDesign when I send files away to the printer because I know that it works. But the website is running on Apache. The monitoring software uh, is Webalizer, which I believe is available for free. So I am using a broad mix of software in this. And as I said, it's not a political statement. It's about the tools for me. Yes, sir. So I actually have three questions for you. Okay. okay. Um, the first one, you did say you were going to put your presentation online. Is that true? It'll be online today. Okay. My second question is, um, do you, do you, would you consider writing a, a small book about your presentation today? 
And would you call it how to make grizzly soup, grizzly bear soup? <laughs> okay. Um, regarding the, the presentation today, I. What's the horrible thing that they say about teachers, those who can do and those who can't teach? Um, I don't want to be in the business of writing teaching books for money. I'm doing this presentation for free because I love having these kinds of conversations. Um, the minute I sit down and write that book, that's comics I'm not writing. I love writing comics. I love, I've got these voices in my head, all of the characters in my comic, they are yammering at me right now to finish up the current storyline because stuff's going to blow up big and I'm excited to write it. And as funny as Grizzly Bear Soup is and as helpful as it might be for some of you, I'm not the guy to write that book. Um, if I find the guy who's written that book, I'll point you at it. I'll link to it on my site. So, but good questions, thank you. Uh, all the way in the back. When's the movie coming out? Um, that's an excellent question. I met with uh, Kickstart Entertainment at Comic-Con um, about them approaching me for an options deal. I gave them the pitch. Haven't heard back yet. So it's at least four years out, and obviously it hasn't been greenlit. Last question. Who feels like the, the last question is, is bubbling up within them? Tell you about the boots. Okay, the boots are from the New Rock Boot and Shoe Outlet Store in Las Vegas. I'm a big fan of cool looking boots. I drove to Comic Con, stopped in Vegas, looked through the window and thought, oh man, I want boots, but they're expensive. And so I made enough money at Comic Con that my wife would let me come back and buy boots. This was, and I posted pictures of them on the web. And, and, New Rock makes boots for science fiction movies like Alien and uh, you, how many Serenity fans here? <laughs> Woo! You like Serenity. So the Firefly TV show, you remember the bounty hunter who was all dressed in red? When he's coming down the ladder, the logo on the front of my boots, you can see on the front of his boots, except they've sanded off the detail on the logo so it's not a New Rock commercial. So, very cool boots. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. I love your work. I love, I love your work. Keep it up. <laughs>